Good morning, friends. We are on chapter three, the last drop of the nation's blood. Democracy dawned in Iran one day in December, 1891, when the Shah's wives put aside their water pipes and vowed to smoke no more. It was no easy sacrifice. Tobacco was one of the great pleasures of harem life, and beauteous odalisks spent hours each day smoking it while reclin reclining on lush divans. By renouncing it, they were defying the Shah, the institution of absolute monarchy, and the imperial system by which most of the world was ruled. By the time the harem women took their fateful step, their husband, Nasir al-Din Shah, had been on the peacock throne for more than forty years. Like other Qajar rulers, he was famous for his excesses. His harem, where he spent much of his time, grew to sixteen hundred wives, concubines, and eunuchs. He fathered hundreds of princes, all of whom had free access to the national treasury. Garish clusters of jewels decorated his palaces. When he became bored by the pleasures of home, he would set out for Europe, accompanied by a huge entourage. He demanded to be called not only Shah of Shahs, but also Asylum of the Universe, Subduer of Climate, Arbitrator of his people, Guardian of the Flock, Conqueror of Lands, and Shadow of God on Earth. And those who refused to honor him were flogged, shot from cannons, buried alive, or set on fire in public squares. To support his lavish tastes, Nasir al-Din Shah sold government jobs, imposed oppressive taxes, and conf confiscated the fortunes of wealthy merchants. When there was no money left for him to take, he came up with the idea of raising cash by selling Iran's patrimony to foreign companies and governments. The British were his first customers. British officials were worried by native uprisings in India and wanted a telegraph line to their command post there. In 1857, they bought a concession to build one across Iran. French, German, and Austrian groups bought a variety of other concessions. A German-born British subject, Baron Julius de Ruder, of news agency fame, won the most breathtaking one of all. In 1872, for a paltry sum and a promise of future royalties, he acquired the exclusive right to run the country's industries, irrigate its farmland, exploit its mineral resources, develop its railroad and streetcar lines, establish its national bank, and print its currency. Lord Curzon described this as the most complete and extraordinary surrender of the entire industrial resources of a kingdom into foreign hands that was probably ever dreamt of, much less accomplished in history. Men who were angered by the extreme one-sidedness of the Ruder concession, Iranian patriots, of whom there were already quite a number, were naturally outraged. So were merchants and businessmen who saw their opportunities suddenly snatched away from them. Clerics, feared for their status in a country so fully dominated by foreign interests. Russia, Iran's most powerful neighbor, was alarmed to see a British concern take so much power just across its southern border. Even the British government, which Ruder had not consulted in negotiating the concession, doubted its wisdom. Finally, Nasir al-Din Shah realized that he had overstepped the limits of the possible, and he revo revoked the concession less than a year after granting it. The Shah's greed, however, did not allow him to abandon the idea of selling concessions. Over the next few years, he sold three to British consortiums. One bought the mineral prospecting rights that had briefly belonged to Ruder, another the exclusive right to establish banks, and a third the exclusive right to commerce along the Karen River, the only navigable waterway in Iran. Russia protested but was placated when the Shah sold Russian merchants the exclusive right to his caviar fisheries, through these and other concessions, control over the nation's most valuable assets passed from the hands of Iranians to those of foreigners. The money they brought into the Iranian treasury sustained the Shah's lavish court for a while, but then, inevitably, it ran out. He raised more by borrowing from British and Russian banks. As Iran sank ever deeper into the mire of poverty and dependence, a thirst for change gripped the population. Bazaars and large cities became hotbeds of protest. Religious reformers, Freemasons, and even socialists began spreading new and radical ideas. News about struggles for constitutional rule in Europe and the Ottoman Empire roused the literate classes. Provocative articles, books, and leaflets began to circulate. Nazir al-Din Shah, isolated in the private world of the Qajar court, was oblivious to the rising discontent. In 1891, he sold the Iranian tobacco industry for the sum of 15,000 pounds. Under the term terms of the concession. Every farmer who grew tobacco was required to sell it to the British Imperial Tobacco Company, and every smoker had to buy it at a shop that was part of British Imperial's retail network. Iran was then, as it is today, both an agricultural country and a country of smokers. 
Many thousands of poor farmers across the country grew tobacco in small plots. A whole class of middlemen cut, dried, packaged, and distributed it, and countless Iranians smoked it. That this, nat that this native product would now be taken from the people who produced it and turned into a tool for the exclusive profit of foreigners proved to too great an insult. A co coalition of intellectuals, farmers, merchants, and clerics, such as had never before been seen in Iran, resolved to resist. The country's leading religious figure, Sheikh Shaz Shirazi, endorsed their protest. In a shattering act of rebellion, he endorsed a fatwa, or religious order, declaring that as long as foreigners controlled the tobacco industry, smoking would constitute defiance of the twelfth imam. May God hasten his appearance. News of his order flashed across the country through telegraph wires the British had built several decades earlier. Almost all who heard it obeyed. Nazir al-Din Shah was bewildered, frightened, and then overwhelmed by the unanimity, unanimity of the protest. When his own wife stopped smoking, he realized that he had no choice but to cancel the concession. To add to the indignity, he had to borrow half a million pounds from a British bank to compensate British Imperial for its loss. History changes course when people realize there is an alternative to blind obedience. Hmm. Martin Luther's challenge to establish Christ established Christianity, the storm of the Bastille during the French Revolution, and the Boston Tea Party were such moments. For Iran, the beginning of the end of absolutism came with the tobacco revolt. It ushered in a new political age. No longer would Iranians remain passive while the Qajar dynasty oppressed them and sold their nation's patrimony to foreigners. So cool. Have a good day, friends.